text for this morning's message comes out of the Old Testament reading that Pastor Wilma read a few moments ago from Exodus 16, and I'll read again verse 2. And the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. This is the text. Please be seated. Dear friends in Christ, what did we ever do and how did we ever survive taking long family trips in the car without smartphones, without GPS, and without movies on demand? How did we do it? And probably revealing my age simply by asking that question here this morning. You know, in those days, before all of those things were even an idea in some inventor's mind, parents were hard-pressed to find interesting things for their children to do during long family trips. When I was a kid, we were so bored, our parents said, play the alphabet game. And the deal with the alphabet game was that you had to look out the window and look for the letters of the alphabet on billboard signs. And I don't know anybody here that might remember the I Spy game, where you have to look out the window and find something interesting to say that you spied, and then everybody else got to ask questions as to what that might be. How boring. And what about Stuckey's, the nationally acclaimed watering oasis responsible for rescuing parents from the two dreaded questions that every parent hated to hear. Number one, when are we going to get there? And number two, I got to go. How did we ever do it? Well, in our story for this morning, there is a large mass of people that are on a journey of their own. They are the children of Israel. They have left Egypt in this mass exodus, newly freed from slavery, having been expelled by the king of Egypt because of a bunch of terrible plagues. Now they were free. And they were free to go to the land that God had promised their forefathers many years before. It was called the promised land. And they were told about that promised land that it was the land of milk and honey. It was a land that most of them had heard about from their ancestors in the stories that were told to them from little all the way up. And now they were on their way. They were no longer slaves in Egypt. Now they were free. But were they really free? Our reading tells us that they were traveling through the desert of Zin. And we're told that it was on the 15th day of the second month after they had come out of Egypt. So in other words, they had been on this journey for around 75 days or so, and they had started to have some practical problems, chief of which was that they had begun to run out of the food and the water and the provisions that they had brought with them from Egypt. The two greatest needs that they had, now that they didn't have to worry about being killed by Pharaoh and his army were the two basic things, water and food. Well, water actually had been provided initially in a most miraculous way. They had come to a watering hole, and when they arrived there, they discovered that the water was so bitter they couldn't drink it. So God gave to Moses a way to make that water sweet, and everyone drank. And that sustained them as they went on their journey, arriving finally at an oasis that all the travelers knew about, a place called Elam. 
And there they were able to replenish their stocks. But now, where the reading for this morning picks up, they had run out of food. And here they were out in the desert where there was very little that could provision a large nation as they had become. And so in their hunger and in their desperation, they began to complain to God and to Moses and to Aaron about the plight they were in. But what was also present in their complaints is what is often present in our complaints when what accompanies the unhappiness is fear. Fear and regret. They began to say, if only we had died in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and had plenty of bread and all the food that we could possibly want. But you have brought us out here into this desert to starve to death. If only. Have you ever noticed that when you begin a sentence or a thought with the words, if only, that it just reeks of regret and fear. It's almost as if in that moment, when you are dealing with whatever you're dealing with in the present and comparing it to what you think it was in the past, that your perspective of life becomes very skewed. And it's almost as if we have a little amnesia about what it was that life really was like in the past as we compare it to the present. And then when we think about the future, it becomes totally bleak. And that's what happened here. Was that their memory and what they began to say about what life was like in Egypt was that, you know, it really wasn't all that bad. Yeah, we were slaves. Yeah, we didn't have our freedom, but you know, we did have food. All we wanted, any time we wanted it. And we didn't have to worry about where the next meal would come from. If only we could go back. Well, that wasn't going to happen. God had a very specific plan for his people in taking them out of Egypt and to his promised land. They weren't going back. And you see, they were headed to Mount Sinai, and we remember from the story that it was at Mount Sinai that Moses then was given the Ten Commandments. And then from there, the plan was that they would go across the wilderness to the Jordan River, that they would cross the Jordan River, and there they would be in the promised land that God had promised. That was God's plan. And he was not going to let that plan be derailed by people who said, if only we could go back. But, you know, we also notice in the story God's compassion for his people, even though they were whining and complaining and accusing. He was not indifferent to their material needs. He cared about their need for food. And so God said to Moses, tell the people, I will rain down bread for you from heaven. And then he gave to Moses some very specific instructions regarding this bread that would come each day, bread called manna. And so the deal with the manna was, was that people were to go out every morning and gather that day enough food, enough bread for that day. And they were to gather it not only for themselves, but also for their families, and then... They were to eat whatever they had gathered for that day. And what eating that bread meant was, was that they would trust that God was good for his word, that he would deliver on the promise the next day, 
that God would provide. And the only exception to that was that the day before the Sabbath, they were to gather twice as much because on the Sabbath they were not to work, but instead they were to rest. God provided for them as he said he would, as he had promised. And when he did that, he accomplished two things. Number one, he enabled them to survive. What a wonderful blessing and gift that was and is. But the second thing is more significant than that. Because providing for them the way he did, he gave them a way to get out of that if-only mindset that had begun to become part of their thinking. And you see, dear friends, the clue to that is in the words that he gave to Moses. He said, in the evening, presumably when I give you the manna, in the evening you will know. And in the morning when you see the manna, and you see that I have provided, in the morning you will see that it was the Lord. You see, when God comes through with his promises as he says he will, then what you and I know and what you and I see are transformed. They're totally changed. No longer do we live in the regret or the fear of the if-onlys. What happens is God's promises move us into the certainty of what is. And the joy of what will be. What is and what will be is ultimately defined by the gift that God has given to us and the gift of his son Jesus. The bread of life as Pastor Wilmer read a few moments ago. And Jesus points out in the gospel lesson for today. And you see, that's because Jesus is the only one who can take the regrets of our lives and the fear of the implications of decisions and choices we've made. He is the only one that can take all of that and cover it with his grace. You see, the beauty of this is that when grace covers the regrets of life about the choices we've made and the smart things we've done and the dumb things we've done. And as we deal with whatever the implications and consequences of that are, what grace does is it covers all of that with the gift of forgiveness. And when forgiveness is there, what happens is that forgiveness, by virtue of God's grace, gives you and me confidence that because God does not hold our sins against us, neither should we. And when we embrace the joy that comes from the promise of God's forgiveness, then what happens is we begin to look at life through real eyes of what really is, not reconstructed amnesia eyes, right? but it empowers us not just to live in the present and the joy of that, but it empowers us with boldness as we move into the future. And it's a boldness that comes with a new way of seeing things and a new way of looking at things. And we're able then to see God at work in ways that we never could have ever imagined. So, dear friends, you and I are like the children of Israel. They were on their journey. Guess what? We're on our journey, too. And as we are, the prayer for us is that we can take hold of the daily grace that God gives to us each day. That grace, as we sang in the song, is enough. The world will tell you it's not enough, but God's word tells us it is enough. We grab hold of it each day. We consume it all and we trust that God will give the grace tomorrow that he gave today. So trust in it every day. Use it up 
every day. There's way more where that came from. Amen. Please rise. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in faith in Christ Jesus our Lord.